Welcome back to the Spin Cycle Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. I'm Johnny Long. I'm Dave Cash. I'm Abby Mickey. Today on the show, Tata Pogacar's many millions, a little license paperwork snafu, and beer is being thrown at cyclocross races. Scandal. Let's get into it. Hey, Abby, welcome back. Hey, nice to be back. It's good to have you back on the show. It's really good to have you back on the show. We got a lot to talk about today because despite the fact that it's off season and the racing's pretty much, well, not pretty much, it is over, uh, barring the Saitama Criterium. Also, road racing is over. My my How the Race is One podcast co-host would, would jump in right here and say, Kaylee, how dare you forget cyclocross? Not I. I, I. I wouldn't say that. I'm just saying that for someone else. I even went to Pan Am's this weekend. I watched it in person. Did you really? Yep. There was only about eight women on the start line for the women's elite race. That's fun. But I was there. <laughs> we're not going to forget about cyclocross because we're going to talk about beer getting thrown later in, in the show, which is really, you know, the top highlight of cyclocross over the last uh, week or so. But first, the thing that we're really going to focus on today is we're back in transfer corner, right? Transfer season, I thought it would be pretty much done by now. A lot of the teams are kind of locking in, well, their entire rosters. And yet, we keep getting these little news blurbs that pop out, right? The, the We have two big ones on the men's side today, and we want to talk about Volering news that well, popped up was a week ago-ish. Uh, but Abby, since we have you on, we want to go a bit deeper on that. Let's start with the, the latest news, though, the most recent news, which was Tuesday morning, Gazzetta del Sport, the Italian daily, uh, famously printed on pink paper. We do love that one. They had a report into Tade Pogacar's new contract. And the numbers associated with it are, well, they're large. They're, they're, very, <laughs> they're quite large. Uh, not anything sort of beyond the realm of, of, I guess, normal within the top end of elite sport. But within cycling, they're big numbers. And, well, Johnny... You just did a piece on this. Give me the rundown. So eight million a year is his new salary without bonuses uh, that runs until 2030. So a six year contract, 48 million. That's some good maths there, which is one million euros more than his old contract. Uh, so he's the new, new highest paid rider in the peloton. To put it into perspective before we discuss it, can I give you some equivalent earnings across other sports? And let me know how many of these people you've heard of. Fulham FC goalkeeper Bernd Leno. Cleveland Cavaliers Georges Nyang. What about Chicago Bears guard Nate Davis? Those uh, are the equivalent Who doesn't earners know Nate? <laughs> for Tadej Pogacar, which is a, I don't know, it just, does it make you sad? Does it feel any sort of way? Is a million euros just a million euros? Is eight million euros just eight million euros? Probably. You know, he earns that money. And he has earned it, right? That's last year he earned it was like two hundred and eighty thousand euros per victory, which is a great which is a great payoff. If you offered that at the start of the year for your team or riders, you'd be like, Yeah, that's that's absolutely worth the money. The more interesting part of the contract is the new buyout clause is two hundred million euros, which <laughs> Which is, which is just you can't buy him. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like a legal failsafe, right, against him leaving UAE Team Emirates, and it works like that because riders don't get traded. There's not like a value of a rider, like in any other sport, right? There's no. It's not like the Premier League where you're like, right, well, we reckon that player's worth fifty million, so that's what we'll pay, and then we have him. It has to work in like another way. Um, so yeah, everyone's run the headlines of, wow, look at all this money. Tali Pogac is obviously, you know, he's he's well liked. I don't think anyone besmirches him the money. Um, for UAE, for their GDP, it's one forty six thousandth of their GDP. Um, I've spent my, I've, I'm coming into this podcast sort of like the tank nearly empty because I've just done a lot of uh, a lot of addition and sums. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Like he's the best rider by far. He's now earning double what any other of the big five are earning, pretty much. And he's probably worth it. You'd probably rather have a Pogaccia than a Van der Poel and a Remco, or a Van der Poel and a Vingago. Probably. That would actually be a fun game to play. Ooh, tough. That's a, yeah, uh, yeah, that's how, an interesting how, one. How many, how many other riders would you need to trade before well, you would Well, trade you guys would take like six to eight Sepp Kusses over one yeah. Tadej Pogaccia. <laughs> and maybe I would too, actually. That is everyone that three. Three. Sepp has, so it's, to me it's a clear... Yeah, what is he? Is he two million a year? 1.5 to two, probably? Sepp? 
probably in that range. These he just did a he, he, I think he just re-upped his contract okay. last year, at, right after the Vuelta, I believe. Okay, so even um, four, four to five, I'd still probably take. Yeah, yeah, four I to five so. step cooses for a Tade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk a little bit about. I mean, it's just they're just big numbers, right? And and like the two hundred million number in particular is just sort of a big kind of fu number. It's not a it's a real number. I mean that that puts him at roughly the same buyout figure as like Kylian Mbappe, right? Who's the maybe the best soccer football player on the planet in a sport that is worth a thousand times more than than pro cycling. So it is. It's just it's kind of an, it's just a big big irrelevant number. What does this mean for pro cycling more generally though? Because the other topics that we want to touch on today, which is Volering's move. And then also Remco's sort of like weird contract stuff uh, and and offers being put in for him from Red Bull that may or may not have been about 10 million bucks. All of this got us talking on Slack, was it yesterday, about how, particularly on the men's side, and I think that the women's side is, is not yet in this place. On the men's side, if you have one of these riders, you absolutely do not get rid of them. Right, and that's sort of what like the two hundred million for Pogacar is, is saying. It's also what is clear with the sort of with, with Red Bull coming after Remco or Visma coming after Red Bull, anybody coming after Remco and Lefevre basically saying you can't take him for pretty much any price because if you take him, I don't really have a team anymore, and that's where the whole sport is right now. If you don't have one of these five guys, you're out of luck and you can't get them. I think the really interesting thing is that. There is still chatter. There's still talk. We still see rumors every week, seemingly, over the past several months about Red Bulls trying to get this guy, Red Bulls trying to get that guy. And at the end of the day, there is movement. I mean, we do see riders end their contracts early. It's rare. It happens, but it, it's rare. It doesn't happen with these talented guys. If you've got them, why would you give them up? And I think going back to the example of like how many Sepkusas would you give for Pogacar, I, I think the real answer is there is no amount. I mean, like the the joke answer is that Kaylee and I would love a Durango, you know. But I think the real answer for any world not even like a hundred. Feel like a hundred. I I, I yeah, honestly think the on. answer is... is enough of them that you constitute the entire peloton and run several teams, and that way you can actually prevent Pogacha from winning. Maybe, but otherwise you're not going to prevent Pogacha from winning. So there's no real logical answer to how many you're going to give up or how many uh, it's not not give up. How many you're going to accept to trade away your Pogacha? Or even your Jonas Vingago or Vanderpool. And then there's this there's this sort of a cliff. There's like a tier where like after that point, then you, maybe you do become available for a hypothetical amount. And it's interesting trying to figure out which riders are never going to be, you know, poached because the teams are never going to agree to let them go. Pogacar, Vanderpool. And then which ones are like, okay, yeah, but maybe for a substantial sum I'd let that rider go. And I think there are some of those out there. It just kind of locks up the market in a really weird way though right because like the, these riders they're, you've got Wout Van Aert on a, on a lifetime contract you've got Tade Pogacar on a six year contract with a 200 million dollar buyout you've got Remco who is apparently turning down 10 million bucks it sounds like that's maybe not actually accurate turning down 10 million bucks from Red Bull mostly probably because he, he has to because Lefebvre won't let him go so like I think it gives more power to those riders, right? Because it allows that the team basically has to, it's theirs then. UAE is, is Pogacar's and Alpecin is Vanderpol's and Quickstep is basically Remco's team at this point. And they have to build around them because if you get rid of that rider, you let that rider go, there's not another one available. So then you just, you're just resigning yourself to fighting for scraps at that point within the sport these days. It's a function of the, of the results, but it's, it's, really changing the way I think that teams have to put themselves together. And if you're not, if you don't have one of those five riders, what on earth are you supposed to do, right? Well, yeah, because the these big victories in the past couple of years have become supremely concentrated amongst these these riders and also the teams with these riders on. So like, even if you look at Van der Poel, Alpes and de Koenig, like you've had Jasper Philipsen pop up with a number of, of big victories. So then that sort of plays into that as well. You, have the, you basically have the haves and the haves nots, right? And that in, increases the value of these riders who are actually able to win the big bike races. And it's not the case of like Pogaccia now sets like a new market is what, how you describe it sometimes in, in other in other ball sports where sort of rising tides, is it rising tides raise all boats? Yeah, I think that's the analogy. Um, 
where then you know you set a new minimum of what and the next guy through is is gonna get because it's not it's way more black and white it's like you either can win or you can't it's not like oh no this is just what a wide receiver earns now i think yeah that the Um, other sport analogy is a good one because in the nfl you often see you know insert quarterback of the moment here signs uh, a contract that is the the biggest ever and then the very next year another athlete does that uh that Mm. happens quite frequently And, and part of it is because that athlete wants to match or beat that that other one like it's part of it's part of the whole deal it's like oh i want to be paid a little bit more than that other guy but in cycling you can't just go out and get that next big talent because it feels like it is so concentrated and it's more concentrated now i i I think we should focus on this it's more concentrated now than certainly has been since i've covered the sport like yes there was a, a pretty across the board domination of the tour de france and and kind of has been in place for quite a while to a very select number of riders. Like the Froome years were very obviously concentrated in one rider. Um, but one day races and the other Grand Tours as well, like Vanderpool and Pogacar and Evenepoel win basically all of them, uh, at least at the highest level. And then there's like a handful of teams that are like just below the surface that are close. And then there's like a bunch of teams that have just no chance. And, and then what are they supposed to do? <laughs> Like at least if That's you're, rough. I'm thinking That's of like Wheel Trek, for example, like which had a, they had a great season. At least they're close, and you can see like Mess Peterson challenging maybe, or there's like a couple of other teams where like all right, you could maybe try to build your team, make it interesting for the rest of us, so that Vanderpool doesn't always win, maybe. But then like, what do you do if you're Decathlon? You know, and, and Decathlon's got exciting riders, but they're not gonna win these. They're not gonna win monuments at at the rate anywhere near the rate that the Vanderpools and Pogachers are doing it. And it's like, well, how do, how do they compete? And I think the answer is right now, they, they don't. Because as you said, like teams aren't getting rid of these riders. It's sort of, Kaylee, we talked about this on Slack. To me, it reminds me of what people call the lock-in effect here in, in the United States and um, assumedly other real estate markets where rates are similar, where anybody who bought a house when real estate or when uh, mortgage rates are really low, they don't want to sell their house because they like to stay locked in with that rate. There's no. This just became a real like like millennial mid thirties conversation it is, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but that means that the inventory is very low because why would you want to give up your your house with your great rate? Or in cycling terms, why would you give up your Pogacar? What what would ever convince you to give up Tadej Pogacar? Apparently two hundred million, but that's like a joke number. Nobody's going to come up with that money. Yeah, uh, P- Pogacar has like lovely high ceilings, uh, loads of period features. <laughs> Um, great transport ac- um, accessibility as well, you know. Monaco is right I'd there, s- right in the middle of everything. I think we should keep talking uh, real estate and rates and all sorts of fun things. <laughs> Actually, I want Abby. I want to pull you in here because the exact opposite thing just happened in the women's peloton. Right? We've we've got we've got Demi Vollering moving from sort of the premier team to another quite good team, but still making a move, which is basically what we're saying is almost impossible or not happening in the sort of current iteration of the men's peloton. Let's talk a little bit more about that move. It's, what, a week on from that a formal announcement, but it was sort of bubbling away for a while previously. Do we know anything else about how that kind of came together and the motivations and why and how that's kind of filtering out to the rest of the of the transfer market as well? Well, interestingly, the women are having a pretty pretty opposite situation on the transfer side and as far as money goes. Um the market is changing so rapidly that everyone, everyone's value is pretty much unknown to them, to their agents, to other teams. Uh, like the money being thrown around on the women's side is pretty insane compared to even two years ago. Um, women are getting offered, you know, like a numbers that you never would have even considered as an option two years ago. And it's not even close to 1 million. Um, so it's, it's, a pretty crazy environment on the women's side. And part of that is why Volering was uh, motivated to move teams. Part of it was the the kind of chaos that was SD Works Pro Time this year. We, we've, you know, talked about it a ton on the Wheel Talk podcast and, and you guys have talked about it as well, just how uh, unprofessional the team has seemed at times, especially, you know, at the tour with the, the cr- crash gate and, um, the spring classics as well. And, and the dynamic between Kopecky and Volering. And it all started in March when, uh, Danny Stam, her team manager announced mid, uh, mid race that she would be leaving the team at the end of the year. And a lot of teams would have been interested in her at that moment. Um, they're, 
I mean, she's the top GC rider in the world at the moment and already last year as well. So as soon as she was on the market, a ton of teams would have wanted to pick her up. You know, like Little Trek is a team that would probably love to win the Tour de France and hasn't had any success there so far as a team. UAE with a million bucks. UAE, right? that there was a rumor about point. UAE team ADQ uh, with a million dollar offer that turned out to be fully fabricated um, in love the media. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a good fabricated million dollars. <laughs> yeah, another really interesting little situation that happened. Yeah, that is a good agent. <laughs> well, and then I guess the, the the other the other kind of angle here, and this is what I've I've wondered about, and I have a, I have a a theory on or a suspicion about, is that the tie to specialize is quite important with the with the volering move, right? And I have I have I have wondered, and I don't think this is confirmed anywhere whether Specialized is going over to, to FTJ because, and this is just a bit of me connecting some dots that may or may not actually be connected, a certain person who works at Specialized, who I follow on Instagram, uh, and who not wouldn't normally be posting about Demi Volering, reposted the Demi uh, Volering is signing for FTJ gotcha. thing on Instagram. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, just got me wondering, because mm. that would make sense, right? Like, let, let's just... Let's just work off the assumption that Specialized is headed over to FDJ. That they're probably paying a significant portion of her salary. I would imagine that's not, that's pretty common practice, particularly for Specialized. I mean, we could we could rattle off a whole bunch of riders over the years that, that that's been true for, right? Uh, Specialized is known for sticking with their top riders when they move if they move teams. Um, but the move is definitely a weird one in the way that like Remco or that, that Tade would probably never leave UAE at this point, or at least not for, you know, six years. Seeing a rider like Volering leave a team like SC Works Pro Time is a really interesting one. They've not really had their top riders leave the team before. I mean, Anna Vandebregen retired, but she even stayed within the team. Lizzie Dagnan left because she was pregnant and they didn't believe that she would be able to keep at the same level when she had the baby so that was a whole that was a whole mess of a situation there if they have a good rider like volering they keep them and a rider like volering wants to stay because it's the only team that can that can really support a top rider but that's not really the case anymore a lot of the other teams are stepping it up and we've seen that you know with with little trek from the moment that they came into the peloton they've been a force and they've had some really bad luck the last couple of years but they they won the giro this year with elise Longborghini. and so volering is able to get support at other teams it, whether or not it's the same level that SC Works Pro Time can offer is another question. But FDJ Suez, with Volering on board, they've definitely bolstered their roster. And I think you could kind of tell from the announcements coming out about who they were signing and who they were losing that they were making space for a big rider to come onto the team. They lost Cecilia Ludwig, who's been like their number one rider for a really long time since she signed for the team. They lost her to Canyon Sram. Uh, Marta Cavalli is leaving the team. It's not been announced yet where she's going. Grace Brown is retiring. So the there was an empty place for a, a big, big named rider like Volering. And they signed a bunch of incredible climbers and young riders who will be able to, you know, support her in a way in the mountains, um, like Juliette Labou, for example. But they also, you know, made sure not to sign too many riders with high ambition. I think Labus is probably the one on the team who has the most ambition besides maybe Avita Music, who's been kind of their star rider since she won a stage of the Giro in 2020. I always like when team. this is true across all sports, like when teams are start to make room for like an upcoming acquisition, but they can't really talk about it. And it's always like, <laughs> oh yeah, we're going to be really bad next year. Just kidding, but we can talk about it, you know? And then you got to wait like months, you know? But we finally have the news now. It's a bit of a vibe shift <laughs> from, a, from a Dutch team to a French team. How do you see that working? Oh, it's going to be a huge vibe shift. Um, SD Works Pro Time is a Dutch team, and anyone who's ever had a conversation with a Dutch person will know that they do not have any kind of filter um, to the point of being mean. <laughs> And she is, and that team is kind of, I mean, we've seen the way that they operate in races, you know, um, they're incredibly We love our Dutch cutthroat. listeners. You're not mean. You're not mean. No. It's the other ones. It's the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, they'll admit it. They'll admit it. 
They will, because they're very blunt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, we've seen in races how cutthroat they are as a team, even even against their own riders, you know. And FDJ Suez is the complete opposite. They are, uh, Stefan Delcourt, their general manager, is like a giant teddy bear. The guy is so soft and he cares so much about his rider's well-being. And we've seen that in the way that he's handled Marta Cavalli and her, you know, series of injuries since that crash in the 2022 Tour de France Femme. Um, It's a team that is incredibly supportive to their detriment almost. And so she's going from a from a pretty harsh environment to one that is, um, you know, all cotton candy and unicorns. So it'll be a completely different vibe to what she's used to. Um, but I think, you know, from what we know about Ballering and how emotional she is, it's going to be a better fit for her, possibly. I mean, we'll see next year when the racing comes. But we saw her, you know, cry after the Tour de France Femme this year. And and she's she's always been really, really emotional after races. And so I think for her, having ha- being in a place that kind of welcomes that emotion um, is going to be, yeah, very, just a different reality for her. So, but it's going to be so, 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 so different. Do you think the posting of the video of uh, Demi Vollering rescuing a goat out of a, a hole while on holiday in Greece is part of getting uh, the cycling world ready for this, this shift in vibe? Because um, <laughs> wouldn't an ST Works Pro Time Rider rescue a defenseless animal from a hole in the ground? Good question. I mean, Lotto Kopecky, uh, when she was on lotto back in 2020 they found a box of puppies on the side of the road at the giro uh one of the early stages of the giro back when it was Mm. 10 stages still or it might have been nine that year but a lot of stages and the team kept the box of puppies in the van the entire race and then smuggled them across the border back to belgium so yes an sd works rider would (laughs) well but she wasn't an sd works at the time since since she came to sd works not a peep of animal rescue. Just left the puppies on the side of the road yeah. once she got to SC Works. Uh, is there any? Is there any opportunity? One of our favorite things here on the on the pod is is manager spats. Do we have any opportunity for like an FDJ SC Works manager spat to happen here? Mm. Like, could, could we get some like Lefevre Ralph Dank action? Kind of just like in the media. Does either of them have a column in Het Newsblad by any chance that they could just <laughs> That's what you need. dunk on people you with? You need unfiltered <laughs> access to just shout at the world. And people give that to Lefebvre. Should we give, should we give them that? Not only did FTJ Suez pick up Ballering, they also uh, snagged a DS from SC Works. Uh, Lars Boom mm. is also going over to, to FTJ Suez next year from SC Works. He actually left the team before the end of the season um to go work for for the french team but i don't think i feel like the the manager spats like danny sam i could for sure see him you know lobbing some insults <laughs> at at stephen delcourt uh but i do not think it would be reciprocated i think that oh. delcourt would probably just be like oh he this that's how he sees it i'll be over here <laughs> With my croissant. Well, that's. I guess that's unfortunate. Mm. You know, such things are good for the pod. Let's be honest. Sorry, Kaylee. We, 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 uh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, all right. I think that's that's about that's about the end of transfer corner. There's a whole lot going on. We didn't even really get into Remco. Actually, uh, maybe we'll save that for later in the show. Or we could save that for after dark. Perhaps talk a bit about Remco and uh, Lefevre and Ralph Dank and how they've been getting at it and in the papers. Uh, we'll save that for after dark. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a pile of news hits for you. All kinds of stuff going on. We've got the Saitama Criterion. We've got beer being thrown at cyclocross races. The pros closet has resurrected itself, zombie style. And we've got Cav Watch, which, you know, is an annual tradition at this point that we'll we'll never stop. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Johnny. The most important race of November third ish. Uh, mm. This atomic criterium happened. Was it over the weekend? Yeah, it was, Kaylee. Uh, it was indeed. I think I watched a, a replay of it. If I'm remembering correctly, mm. Primoz Roglic was off the front. He was. Uh, he was 
riding just absolutely as hard as he possibly could. You could tell by all the shoulder rocking. Yeah. And then um, right at the line, he was caught. Right at the line. Shocking. By by Benio Gramai mm-hmm. and I think some other people. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, can I, real quick, I actually really like something about this. The guy who probably should have won actually won. Like that doesn't usually happen at Saitama. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's actually kind of true. Do we think? Okay, so the reason why I'm being uh, uh, facetious, yeah, somewhat sarcastic, facetious is, is yeah, sarcastic, facetious is, is probably the right word. The reason for that is because this is a, this is a, this is the WWE of of bike racing, right? Like it is basically <laughs> scripted, uh, and the you know bike racers aren't actors, and so Definitely you can not. tell. <laughs> you can tell. Do we think Binyam Gurmai? chuck the script out the door and just won anyway is that is that a, is that a possibility no because he's one no of the way. He, he was in the green, in the jersey. green jersey yeah rising star there were some, there were some Eritrean fans there as well so I guess didn't want to disappoint them um, Cavendish didn't win I don't think he even came top three in the end so that's uh, oh, wow. that's shocking uh, the one my one complaint this year I went last year great time great time out everyone enjoys it understand that when we talk about this in a slightly uh not serious way it's not we're not besmirching it it's just it's It's just great it's just great but this year they didn't the acting wasn't as good as it has been before like usually (laughs) they make a better better show of it and i think maybe it's been too long of a season maybe they should have picked someone else other than primos roglic because as we've seen from his morton's adverts he's not you know he's not going to make the transition to movie star afterwards the other thing to come out of it is that Chris Froome, I think, won some sort of combativity award. And then no. all, then I think was so buoyed by that that he's since said that he would like to return to the Tour de France next year, either to chase a stage win or to support uh, Derek G. So he's, mm. sli- he's slowly walking himself back into it. After he's like, no, I'm not about, you know, I've given up on my dream of winning the Tour again. He's now slowly walking himself back into uh, into the corridor of hope, which... Everyone needs a corridor. Of I hope think it's a lives. reasonable goal for him. Like ride for Derek. G. I would love, I would love to see him win a tour stage. Do we think yeah. that's a reasonable? I don't, think he will. I don't think that's reasonable. No, he will. He not was win a third, tour stage. wasn't he? Like two years ago, well, not that long that's ago. Not first, was. yeah, two years. That's not first, Dane. I mean, sure, Johnny. That's a very American attitude that you have there about it. <laughs> you ain't first, you're last. Yeah, Ricky wow. Bobby. Well, come on over whenever you like. <laughs> <laughs> we love Saitama. It's just a fun way to end the season. You know, it's just a good, it's a good vibe. And well, and then next week is Singapore, the Singapore criterion, mm-hmm. which is the sister one, which is supposed to be Mark Cavendish's final ever race, guys. Do you think he'll win? He's got to win. That's why he didn't win this one, surely. Right. So you heard it here first. And if he doesn't win, then that means he's definitely coming back next year because then ASO will be punishing him for an- announcing the retirement that won't actually be the retirement. Mm. He did at one point say this would be his last season. And then later on, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do next year. Well, this, they said this is going to be his last race um, in like all their email. ASO did. PR release things. Yeah, ASO did. Mm. Um, and then he said at the Tour de France team presentation, not team presentation, route presentation, that you you know you always think it's your last one, but then afterwards you're always like, oh, I just want to go back. And he, I don't think he said never say never, but it was something to that effect. And it's just like, come on, come on, too much titillation. Even I'm getting bored. <laughs> He's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. <laughs> of course he will. Do you think Astana would bring him back in? Is Astana locked up their full uh, roster? Interestingly yet? enough, Mark Renshaw said that he is not expecting to have Cav on his roster next year. I mean, that could all be a smokescreen, but he this just came out a couple of days ago. He mentioned this, so. It could be, uh, I see smokescreen. I don't think Mark Grenshaw is, I don't know. Uh, smokescreen. I don't think they'd tell. Smokescreen. Yeah. I think Cav will do it. He, I think he's looked at the first, like, eight stages of next year's tour and realized he doesn't have to climb a single mountain. He can just ride the first eight, eight nine stages and then peace out yeah. before the first rest day. You heard it here. Well, Probably not you first, heard it here second. Second. Because... <laughs> Uh, cycling journalist Barry Ryan Ooh. said it on stage 21 of this year's Tour de France, <laughs> which, is, uh, which was great. And he's probably going to be proven true. Uh, I think he probably will be. Uh, all right, let's keep moving through the, the news hits here. So uh, cyclocross has happened and some beer was thrown. And I think it was yeah. uh, Iserbit had, had the beer thrown in his yeah. face. Same guy who stomped somebody's derailleur a couple weeks ago. Yeah, like, Alexander Camp. Like, fully stomped this derailleur. It was very bad vibes. So that, that feels like karma, probably. 
<laughs> some kind of karmic yeah, reaction. Yeah, although someone uh, pointed out, I can't remember who it was or where I saw it, someone pointed out that I think the next, like following is a bit stamping on camp, uh, camp proceeded to basically crash nearly an entire cyclocross field like the next race oh. with some sort of maneuver. So the vibes are slight, are slightly bad in the cyclocross world. Yeah, I don't know. The cyclocross, well, the vibes might be bad for those two, too, but like on the early? rest of the races, like the last couple of weeks has, has been, they haven't been the ones winning. It's, it's Thibaut Nice and, and Lars Vanderhaar. Yeah. Thibaut won yeah. European champs over the weekend, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And then his dad said yeah. that uh, his team would have had even more success had they not had some chain failures. Uh, which I love the mentality there, where it's like, yeah, my kid just won Euros, but we would have done even better, except for this one thing. Better than winning? More riders. How do you do you that? Know, up there in the... Oh, in yeah. the other... Oh, uh. I see. Okay. The, um, what other sports do you have so many, like, dads commenting on? <laughs> Definitely baseball. Baseball's got a lot of father-son, you know, dynasties. Really? But what, where the media immediately go for the reaction Oh, that's the true. It seems, like a, it seems like a very Belgian thing. They love to... And it's, it's like, all over. Yeah. It's like, hey, what is... What does Remco's dad think of this? You know, they... I think it's because everything's like everyone just lives like half an hour down the road. So you're just like, oh, well, I'll just knock on the door on, on my way home to to Ghent. And it's nepotism. There's so much nepotism in cycling. True. Oh yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. I'm just waiting for people to go to you, Abby and Tom's, when you're certainly going to be a superstar cyclist. Kid does something. So 20 years from now, you're oh, gonna yeah. get those calls. Uh, Abby's Abby's got a nepo baby. There we go. <laughs> I think she just called Tebow Nice a, a nepo baby as well. So write that headline. Chuck it on the homepage. Cool. Who, okay, who's the Dutch have come a cropper? Tebow Nice. <laughs> who's next on the uh, on the hit list, Abby? <laughs> Matthew Vanderpool, nepo baby. Yeah, definitely. Big yeah. time. Big time. Big huge time. time. Would never have gotten where he is otherwise. The um actual nepo baby is the nikola vinokurov oh yeah uh, who rides for astana and it was a very unfortunate uh, moment because you know how they have the uh, like the rider cards mm. for autographs and stuff um alphabetically vinokurov was at the bottom of the pack on the astana bus and there were loads of packs in like the front of the of the bus window so it made it just look like there were tons and tons of nikola vinokurov <laughs> like cards whereas like who like no a little bit of disrespect, not no disrespect. Like, who wants one of those right now? <laughs> I feel like um, that's a but collector's then item. Realized, well, well, not really, because like there was loads of them, <laughs> but it's because that was at the bottom. So there were other riders there. I thought it was just like four hundred Vinokurov cards. Anyway, now, now my head's just spinning around with Nepo baby ideas for pro cycling. Well, we've already dis yeah. we've discussed your Nepo baby, uh, Kaylee. What's my number? Being born at altitude. Well, oh, being yeah. born at altitude. You're trying to. You're trying to. Uh, you know, genetically or whatever. Exceptionally high hematocrit. Yeah. Yeah. Where did go? <laughs> yeah. I will be serving that child a right of reply in about twenty years. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, anything? Anything else from the world of cyclocross? I feel like this is the problem with mentioning cyclocross is that we do. We don't tend to actually talk about the, any of the bike racing. So the, the true cyclocross fans out there are probably disappointed in us, but also we find these other things much more interesting to talk about than i think they sh they would have twigged by now this isn't the this podcast isn't the podcast for your cyclocross news yes sorry yes well we don't actually have one <laughs> that's one we don't have uh sorry i apologize a little bit of news here i think this is uh no, we got two more pros closet is back uh this is this is i guess great news uh, mostly because well one i think it's a useful kind of marketplace to have and two I think they laid off 60, 70 people when Pro's Closet shut down. Uh, what was it a month ago, six weeks ago, something like that? Um, and a lot of those people have now been rehired by this sort of uh, risen from the ashes situation. So basically some of the old uh, staff, including I think that the chief revenue officer and a couple others, um, Justin England uh, among them, uh, have found some funding. And it sounds like basically they've purchased the IP, purchased the kind of customer list, and other than that, are, are rebuilding from the ground up uh, because like, even the building that they had before and everything inside it was all auctioned off. And actually that auction, I think, wrapped up beginning of last week. You could buy like the screwdrivers that the pros closet people used to put bikes together with. Probably, screwdriver is not a good example. The Allen keys that they used to put 
bikes together with uh like everything absolutely everything stools and chairs and and shelving and like everything was for sale right it all got auctioned off so none of that is part of this new thing that's that's being built but yeah we'll see what they can do i mean it, we've talked a- about this sort of topic we talked about pros closet a couple times i think on the pod and and the fact that they kind of got way over their skis got way too much sort of vc money trying to be way bigger than they actually could ever be and this is, I mean, is sort of a right sizing so there are definitely lots of unfortunate sort of consequences of this still there's folks out there who had credit with pros closet we're not really sure that that still exists uh there's still lots of employees that that are not going to get rehired uh, so it's still not a totally rosy picture not an entirely nice story but it is ending i guess more positively than we would have thought a couple of weeks ago so there's your pros closet update don't need really any more on that. And finally, someone explained this to me. So Sarah it messed up some paperwork and lost one of their star riders. What's going on? Yeah, uh, so there was a deadline to apply for a World Tour license. Sarah Tizit missed the deadline. Uh, unclear what it was that made them miss the deadline. I don't know if they necessarily just messed up paperwork or if they needed to get some ducks in a row before they filed it. Who, who knows? They, they probably Admin didn't. error. Yes. According to their Twitter. That's what they said. Um, so when that happened, when they missed that deadline, which, by the way, they have since, to provide context, they have since said that they've now filed the paperwork and they're expecting to be world tour next year. But when they missed that deadline, uh, it triggered a, a clause in their rider contracts allowing their riders to terminate their contracts, which makes sense because if the team actually suddenly wasn't world tour when expected to be, then those riders should be willing, you know, should be able to leave if they want to. And I think unexpectedly, <laughs> Uh, Cedrine Carbol, who was actually quite good, one of their best riders, young, really, really talented, promising rider, won a stage at the Tour de France Femme, decided, uh, yeah, okay, I am going to terminate my contract and, and move on. So the team <laughs> said uh, today, this is Tuesday, uh, it was a mutual. They used the word mutually in their announcement. And then they, they quoted never, the never team mutual. manager saying, basically, to paraphrase, I'm pretty bummed about this. So to me, it suggests that it's not entirely mutual. That she is taking advantage of the opportunity to leave, which, you know, fine, good for her if she wants to. I believe she had a year left on her contract. I think the team was expecting her to keep riding on it with them. And, you know, they'd had a really strong year. They made some modest gains overall in the, in the, uh, you know, the rankings between uh, her and, and Marta Locke and a couple of other riders on the team. They, yeah, they're looking good for next year and, and had a reason to be optimistic about continued growth and success. And now, yeah, now she's leaving as of, as of press time, this could change by the time the pod comes out, but we don't know where she's going. Uh, it would be kind of surprising if she didn't have a plan in place. Uh, but at the same time, Abby pointed this out right before we got on, that it is pretty late in the, in the game to like go find a new team. Yeah, most of the women's teams were like fully done with their signings in like June. She's a rider that a team would probably make room for, given the, the talent that she has and what she's been able to accomplish this year. She won... Durango Durango in horrendous co- conditions earlier in the year and also Trivoli in all similar similarly horrendous weather conditions um and her win at the Tour de France Femme she was like solo for 13k um basically at the end there and couldn't be caught and the first French woman to win a stage of the new Tour de France since it's revamping in 2022 so she's a rider that, yeah, a team like, I don't know, Visma Lisa Bike, for example, would want to make room for a team that, that really needs uh, some help in the results area that, you know, if you're not boss. Help in the results area is a really nice way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's seemed pretty happy on Sarah Does It WNT, and um, I think all signs pointed to her you know, being happy to, to stay for another year and maybe even re-up her contract. So it was a pretty surprising bit of news, honestly. And the fact that her and Marta Locke are now both le- leaving the team, uh, they've announced some new signings already, Sarah Tiz at WNT, but that's a big hit for them. Maybe it was a, some sort of intrusive thought where you know the loophole exists and you're just like, I just, you just can't resist. <laughs> you're just like, I'm just going to... You don't get the opportunity every day. <laughs> um, mess around and find out. Not without a huge buyout clause, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah. She must have a plan. Like, there's no Surely. way you'd just be like, yeah. oh, I'm out of here, you know? <laughs> like, there's just no... <laughs> well, Kaylee, we're in our mid-30s. She's, she's like, just in her early 20s. She's at that age where she's, you yeah. know, maybe more willing to give it a go. Yeah. I don't know. I used to be like this, and now, you know, 
you just got it when you have a small to medium amount to lose it just cripples you <laughs> cripples you in your decision making still got those uh, frosted tips though yeah yeah for now all right time to wrap up that section we're gonna take a quick break here when we come back briefly well ronan sent in a voice note actually it's not briefly that was a lie ronan sent in a quite long brief <laughs> a quite long voice note when we come back Welcome back, everybody. All right, so Johnny, explain what's what's going on here. Why did why did Ronan send us this? To clarify, it was a brief voice note for Ronan, mm. um, compared to some of his other monologues on the show, which we which we love and we love him. <laughs> uh, but a man of brevity, he is not. We got a great listener question from Drew Dunst, which uh, was directed specifically at Ronan. So then I just sort of handed it off to him. So here here's the here's the question from Drew. If I shave the front of my legs but leave the rear of the calf with flowing locks, A, is this a cycling mullet? But more importantly, analogously to a cam tail, is it more aero? Sorry for stumbling over the word analogously. <laughs> but it's, that's a hard one to say. Um, I mean, does anyone want to have their offer their opinions before we listen to three and a half minutes of Ronan's actual explanation? Uh, I mean, it's definitely a mullet. It's definitely a cycling mullet. Yeah. yeah, like that. That's an easy. That's yeah. an easy one to answer. I'd say my my default expectation is that yes, it's more arrow. So I'd love to know if it is. Yeah. Well, let's. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I have. I have a theory, but I. I. I think it might overlap with Ronan's theory. So let's hear from Ronan. I like the thinking, but uh, the usual caveats apply here that you probably can't see arrow, and or you need to test everything to really truly know the answer. But I suspect that we're not going to see an arrow gain from drew's leg hair mullet and <laughs> um, the cam tail that he's referenced first of all that's sort of a separate thing in that it's used in frame designs and that uh the thinking being that by cutting off the rear of a teardrop arrow profile you get nearly the same arrow gains because you sort of mimic the airflow around the frame the flow sort of thinks there's going to be a, a teardrop profile there, but there isn't. And in chopping it off, you you only lose a little bit of the arrow gains, but you save uh, a lot in terms of weight. And it's just not really going to work the same with legs and hair. First of all, body hair isn't like a solid surface. It's going to move about a bit. It's not dense enough or rigid enough to sort of to work in the same way. Uh, and on top of that, flowing hair on the back of the calf or the back of the leg or the back of that whole cylindrical shape would I'm going to guess, create more turbulence and potentially friction and thereby increase drag rather than being a, an arrow saving of any any type. Like Keeping hair in that high turbulence zone is probably more likely to disrupt airflow off it than, than to improve it. Uh, and so I think the the optimal hair setup is probably still fully fully shaved. It does have me wondering though, if we took the inverse of Drew's suggestion. So if we kept the front and the sides of the legs hairy and then shaved the rear, uh, the trailing edge, might that, that there, it could be something in that. Uh, I'd, again, uh, I don't think hair is a rigid enough structure to be of any sort of, to be a true aerodynamic intervention. So um, I, I'm still going to go ahead and guess that uh, fully shaved solution is probably still the fastest, but perhaps there could be something you know, I'm thinking there that by keeping the fronts and the sides hairy, you're sort of inducing a bit of turbulence. And then the smooth trailing edge might just help in that in that turbulent zone behind the legs and, and sort of smooth that up a bit. Um, just drop a little bit of the, the suction drag on the on the back of the legs. I'm, I'm not sure. The other thing you could try um, is like just uh, if you think of that Kit Kat ad from years ago where they shave Kit Kat into the back of a guy's head when he's getting a haircut, um, just maybe do like trip strips down either side of the leg. So like one line of hair running straight down, maybe about 30% cord length of the, if you think of the, the lower leg as a cylinder, just having it sitting slightly back from the front on either side. You could get sort of a trip strip like effect from that. But again, hair is not really, even stubble isn't really, stubble is not high enough and proper long hair isn't strong enough. And it, it probably moves about that much that you're adding in more, turbulence and friction there than you than you you really want so uh, again can't see it working and i think i think my advice is 
fully shaved. And if you're willing to try these different hair designs on your legs, probably just be willing to use high aero socks. <laughs> so what you just heard was actually two separate voice notes. So so willing was Ronan to to share those nuggets of information with us. Uh, and who will ever forget from now on the phrase trip strips for your legs? <laughs> I love it. What a world. What a world. Uh, we, we've we been talking about getting Ronan into a, into a wind tunnel at some point in 2025 and doing some testing. And I think that this is maybe something we should add to the list. He'll never leave if you send I him I know. There. <laughs> Which is fine. He can just live there and just like file copy from the wind tunnel. It'll be great. Yeah. It'll be great. Well, Drew, thank you for sending that question in. That was a great question. On that note, we want to do a mailbag coming up here soon. So... We need questions from all of you. You need to head to escapecollective.com slash hello, and then you can send us a voice note. You can select which podcast you want to send the voice note to, so make sure you send it to Spin Cycle. And the kind of questions we're looking for here are not sort of directly related to anything that we've already talked about, uh, or like a news event, something a little more evergreen. What are your sort of like big philosophical questions about cycling? Like, would you rather have 100 Sepkuses or one Tade Pogaccio? Would you rather fight 100 Sepkus sides Tade Pogaccios or one mm. Tade Pogaccio sides Sepkus? Mm. That doesn't really work. That feels like an easy horses. one to answer. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't really work that way. But yeah, uh, questions like this, or, or you know, like you'd be slightly more serious. You could, you could ask us about you know, some of this transfer stuff. Like, and we don't want to talk about sort of news, but the sort of how all this stuff works and what its impact is on the sport. Love talking about that sort of thing. Anyway, send us your questions. We will answer a couple of them coming up in a mailbag episode. Probably end of this month. I believe that's the plan. Would you rather have a hundred Sepkus size Gaia Riolinis or one Tade Pagacar size Ellen Van Dyke? Whoa. Wow. <laughs> that's a good question. Whoa. That is a good question. Oh man. I'd have to think about that. Because the Sepkuses will go uphill faster, but the an Ellen Van Dyke size Tati Pogacar is a pretty scary thought. That's a terrifying I think thought. You, you perfectly uh made a cycling version of that analogously to the normal version. <laughs> uh, so that was really good there. Uh all right, send us your questions. Escapecollective.com slash hello. Drop them in there. We appreciate you. All right, now we're going to head into After Dark. We're going to talk a bit about this Remco news and mm. the alleged $10 million offer from Red Bull that some sources are saying never actually existed. And Patrick Lefebvre says, doesn't matter if it existed, he's not going anywhere anyway. We're going to talk about that in After Dark, plus probably some other After Darky type things. So stick around if you're a member. If you're not a member, what are you doing? Head to escapecollective.com slash members and sign up get access to the good stuff at the end of each one of these podcasts all right see you next week or we'll see you in about 15 seconds 